I was woken up in the middle of the night to help a woman who had come in at around 28, 29 weeks of gestation in premature labor at our birthing center in Salima. I walked into the labor ward and before I could even help uh, examine her, she delivered a baby boy who was perfect, but unfortunately very tiny and struggling for every breath due to prematurity. He only weighed over two pounds. The only oxygen we had available was nasal cannula, which was much less than what this little boy needed. I called the referral center, Salima District Hospital, and I was quickly informed that at 28 and 29 weeks, this is just a miscarriage. They don't offer anything for babies of this size. I wrapped the little boy in a chitenje and handed him back to his mother, who quietly mourned as her sweet baby boy continued to fight through every breath until he took his last one. The nurses surrounded her and comforted her and she picked up the phone and called her family to let them know that she had a miscarriage. The little boy was buried in an unmarked grave because to his village, he was a little boy that never really was except to his mother. As I watched this grieving mother, my mind wandered away to a memory of my sister Mabel in the United States. I got a similar distress call around two o'clock in the morning while I was in Houston because Mabel was also 28 weeks pregnant with placenta previa and had started bleeding very heavily. She was worried that she and her baby were in danger. I instructed her to go to the hospital right away where by an emergency C-section, she delivered my niece, Emma, weighing also just a little over two pounds, just like this little boy. Emma was tiny, she could not breathe on her own and unlike this little boy, however, when she was delivered, there was a room with neonatal intensives in their delivery room. They immediately took Emma, started IV lines, feeding tubes, and placed her into the incubator and then straight to the neonatal intensive care unit. She spent many weeks there being supported with oxygen, nutrition, antibiotics, fluids, and even got some little cuddles from my sister and mom, Mabel. Emma survived. Today, Emma is a feisty, stubborn little three-year-old girl. She has opinions about everything. And she knows exactly how she, what she wants and exactly how she wants it. And there's nothing that she can express. In fact, sometimes we miss when she had a lot less vocabulary. As I looked at the grieving mother in Malawi holding her sweet boy, I wondered what if they had the same access that Mabel and Emma had in the United States. I looked at the heavens and asked what justice exists in these two exact same experiences, same humanity, same love of a mother, and two completely different outcomes. Is one life worth more than the other? Is it worth based on where the child is born? I found myself asking God how I could reconcile what I was experiencing in Malawi and my, what life was as a doctor in the United States. On another day, I was at a local district hospital, the major referral center, getting ready to do a scheduled gynecological surgery. While I was preparing for my patient, I was called to a small minor emergency room that was next door. As I walked into the room, there was a chilling sound of blood flowing onto the floor from a table. I looked and noticed there was a lifeless newborn on the counter and a young woman who was bleeding under, profusely under spinal anesthesia. The clinical officer pointed to her abdomen and much to my horror, this woman had ruptured her uterus. In fact, her uterus was blown out. After prolonged labor in a patient who had a previous C-section and, um, and was unable to get her C-section fast, her uterus had blown out through her bladder and I could see the Foley bulb just hanging there. It had blown all the way down to her pelvis, the cervix and all the way down. I mean, literally it looked like a bomb had gone out in her pelvis. She had already delivered another dead baby by C-section after a cord prolapse because she couldn't make it to the hospital in time from her small village. This time she had tried to get to the hospital on time by the doctor's orders and she came at the very first signs of labor, but unfortunately, with only two operating rooms in, in the hospital, they were fully booked. She labored for hours while waiting for her turn to have a C-section until her uterus ruptured. You see, Salima District Hospital serves about 500,000 people and they only have one major operating room and one minor room. I work for Houston Methodist Hospital and one of the newer hospitals in the Woodlands is one of the ones I cover. They have 25 major operating rooms and they're about three miles walking distance to other three major hospitals with similar resources. 
Dr. Nadia, a urogynecology fellow that was with me, joined me into the room and she realized that we were being asked to do something that looked impossible. The anesthesiologist quickly informed us that he didn't have anything to hold up this patient's blood pressures which were dropping. He also reminded us that the blood bank was empty but they sent somebody to go find her family in the village so they could come give blood. And we knew that if they're gonna travel by bicycle ox cart, they were never gonna make it there on time. This minor operating room had no monitoring machines, no surgical lights, no cautery, just a few surgical sponges. Nadia looked at me in shock and asked if there was another center where we could send this patient where she could be better taken care of. I reached out to her, grabbed her hand, and looked at her and told her that we were the ones that they were sending her to. There was nowhere else she was going. I told her she and I would clamp, we would cut, we would tie, and we would suture until either the patient died or God saw it fit that she survived. I said a quiet prayer and began the procedure with no lights, no cautery, no blood, and we would actually literally wring out the sponges with blood and reuse them. The patient had a spinal anesthesia and she went from groaning in pain from the pressure that she was experienced to being very weak and quiet. And the only way we knew she was alive was we could see from a small little monitor that her heart was still beating and she had a very low blood pressure. We clamped, we cut, we tied, and removed the damaged uterus, repaired the bladder and her pelvis, and miraculously she walked out of the OR with a hemoglobin of three. She was admitted to an unmonitored mattress on the floor in the postpartum unit, next to mothers who were, who were breastfeeding their live crying babies because there was no ICU unit in the hospital. It was a long night and I've never prayed harder because I knew she was not going to be alive the next morning if she didn't get blood. I braced myself in the morning as I walked into the postpartum unit. As I turned the corner and looked down at the mattress, our patient was alive, even though she still hadn't received blood. Her Foley bag had clear urine. I wasn't sure if I cried harder looking at the clear urine or the fact that my patient was alive. For the surgeons in the room, you understand when you bag your ureter, it's a really bad day. Even though she was very weak, the patient opened her eyes and reached out to Dr. Nadia and uttered zikomo, which means thank you in Chichewa. It took all day for her family to get there to give her blood and she was able to get it. And her discharge from the hospital was a joyous occasion, but also very sad because now a young woman was going home for a second time with no live baby. And this time, no chance to have another one in a culture where having a child was something that meant everything to a young woman. She was happy to be alive, but also acutely aware that finding a life partner who would accept her knowing she couldn't have children was also going to be a miracle that would have to come from God. One week later, I was back in Houston laying in my bed and I got a call at two o'clock in the morning from an OBGYN friend. There was a patient having a postpartum hemorrhage who had failed all the conservative management and needed an emergency hysterectomy. As I entered into the room, I was aware that the patient was being monitored. I could see her vital signs on multiple screens in the room. There was a massive transfusion protocol, which means they would be sending blood and blood products automatically to the room until we told them the patient was stable and we didn't need them. I was aware the patient was bleeding heavily and yes, I was aware this was a life-threatening situation just like it was a week ago in Malawi. However, I also had an awareness that unlike Malawi, the odds was much more in the favor of this young mother because I had room full of support staff, I had lights, I had cautery, and I had a limited supply of sponges, anesthesia, monitoring, medications for blood pressures and medications to stop bleeding, and large quantities of blood. This young mother underwent this postpartum hysterectomy. She received 20 units of blood and blood products and then an ICU admission. As I took care of her, my mind was acutely aware that just a week before this, I was taking care of another woman in a similar life-threatening condition with two completely different resources available to me. A dark cloud suddenly fell on me as I started to remember my childhood in Malawi with similar stories of now what seemed like senseless loss of young women's lives. Having a baby in Malawi was then and still remains a life and death decision for many women in Malawi. I remember taking my Malawian mother to a baby shower in the United States on one of her visits. 
As I toured an unborn baby's room and admired the clothes hanging in her closet, my mother was shocked at the presumptuousness that we all had, assuming that this pregnancy would end positively. In Malawi, a pregnant mother is also known as Mai Wapakati, which means a woman in between. Because pregnancy literally is a state in which a woman is between life and death. This is the world my mother knew. In my world, however, a term pregnancy was equal to a guaranteed new life, and this was very foreign to her. You should have seen the look on my mother's face the day I went to have my baby. It was as if she was seeing her baby walking into her grave. I had to reassure her that I was in America and there was a 99% chance I was gonna come back alive and so would my baby. I don't know how my sweet mother has made it through watching five of her daughters take some, that same walk to what she sees to be the valley of the shadow of death. As an American trained doctor, I have wrestled with these experiences and they have challenged and crushed my core beliefs. God will provide our needs. When such disparity exists, I wonder about his provisions. The Bible tells us that we're all created in the image of God, both man and woman. In the face of what seems to be injustice to my human perception, how do I reconcile the God who loves all people to the pain and suffering I'm now seeing as a doctor between two different worlds? James 5.13 says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him praise. This verse reminds us that in suffering, we are closest to the divine and have the acute realization of a need for divine power that is greater than ourselves to intervene on our behalf. In times of cheer of plenty, we should also remember to praise God for his provisions. As I mentioned before, I grew up in a small village and we struggled for very basic needs of life. We also had an extreme dependency on God. I remember we literally prayed for God to provide us our daily bread because we didn't always know where our next meal was going to come from. I'm humbled daily by the faith of Malawian Christians who in the face of suffering really believe in the sovereignty of God. Often in our times of comfort, we forget and we become more self-reliant and we think we can fight our own battles. Medical technology in the US is so advanced and I've seen miracles of technology and sometimes we get a God complex and forget our creator. I remember in residency doing a perimortem C-section in 32 week pregnant woman who had ruptured her aorta and she was dying and they called me to do a C-section in the emergency room because she wasn't gonna make it. I went down, did the C-section and soon after her heart rate returned and the cardiothoracic team that was on standby opened her chest stuffed it with towels and took her to the cardiothoracic unit where she underwent a repair and restarted her heart. Seven days later, she walked out of the hospital carrying her little boy, Ethan. She actually came back a few years later and wanted to know if she could have another baby. I couldn't say no fast enough. <laughs> During the same period of time, I took a trip to Malawi where I saw my dad struggle to revive a five-year-old girl who was dying of dehydration. He knew how to use an interosseous needle, but it wasn't available to him. And watching him place that dead baby on her mother's back to take a walk back home was very heartbreaking, especially after I'd seen the miracle of medicine here. Suffering continues to be a difficult concept to reconcile. The concept of believing in God who allows suffering and still, he so, still see his sovereignty is no clearer to anyone than those who are suffering. In 2 Corinthians, it says, for the light momentary affliction is preparing us for an internal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are internal. We live in a world that is broken and filled with injustice. God is calling us all to focus on the things that are eternal. When I lived in Tonja, I often felt forgotten and the cries of the people living there seemed like they were not heard. I remember the first missionary who came and built the church, which also became our home later because we did not have a home. That missionary was an answer to prayer. When we prayed for food, there was not manna that came from heaven. God sent faithful friends and family who on the very same day we prayed brought us food to eat. 
There are millions of unreached people groups and millions of people that feel forgotten. And God is asking us all to hear their prayers and open our eyes and see them. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing your labor is not in vain. God has given each one of us a unique gift to serve his people. You could be the first person that builds a school in a village where the kids have never had access to education. You could also be the person who brings a family a meal that was praying for the next meal on their table. My life story could have ended in the village, but God in his wisdom brought Donna Ivy, an American medical missionary who came for a two week medical mission trip. Donna answered yes to her call and brought me here to the United States where I am now a United States trained gynecological oncologist. She was the answer to a little village girl's prayer to become a doctor someday. I realize now that even though I felt forgotten, God had been faithful all of my life. My childhood experiences were part of the foundation of what is now my calling today. In the voices of the wailing mothers and the, who lost their babies, and in the tragedy of young women dying while they were giving birth, God's voice was asking me, who shall I send? Who will go? And just like Isaiah, I answered, here I am, send me. My family and I have since founded Port Hauria, which means safe haven in English. We've provided healthcare in the outpatient clinic to over 200 women and children a day and a birthing center that has delivered over 300 babies in just over a year of opening. We have an owner furniture with 120 kids, a school educating over 400 children, and we have given scholarships to 63 secondary and post-secondary students. We'll soon be looking at building an operating room to increase capacity, um, given the fact that Salima only has the two operating rooms. My message is that as you hear all the speakers, and you visit all the booths this weekend, is that you will open your eyes, you will really open your ears and your hearts, and you will start to hear the cries of the forgotten and the unreached people. God already knows that you have what he needs to reach the unreached and to find the forgotten. <laughs>